So for those of you who might have spotted that what's written on the slide is not the same as what Rabbi introduced me, I changed jobs recently. So I've moved from strategic consulting into overall portfolio leadership uh, with my company, which means looking after the clinical trial process from once it leaves the site through to final report. Um, when we're talking about randomization in clinical trials, and I've already spotted the debate, it can be a Z or an S, both are acceptable on this side of the pond. Um, on the other side, they disagree. And you'll see it as both here because um, I'm Irish, I work for an American company, it gets confusing. <laughs> Depends on which spell checker is on on a given day. There are key regulations governing statistics in clinical trials and following these is important in order to make sure the design of your clinical trial is appropriate. We've heard already about ICHG E6, good clinical practice, but there's also E9, statistical principles for clinical trials, and E3, which is how to write the clinical study report at the end of the trial. Now this report is the full detail of the full study conduct, not just the highlights that get into a paper, with the very reduced methods section that we discussed yesterday. Um, and then there are some other uh, guidelines and documents that are also present. Uh, techniques to avoid bias, and basically the answer is randomization. It's not always possible. <coughs> Those are the practical considerations we have to work with, but by and large, there are good reasons for randomizing uh, within your trial. Um, Declan spoke to that in terms of the design discussion yesterday, so what I'm focusing on today is not when we do or when we don't, but assuming that you are randomizing, um, how do you go about it and what considerations in your randomization design should you apply? Randomization allows unbiased allocation of subjects to treatment. It removes selection bias, where investigators choose who gets to go on what drug, and removes confounding, where you might have accidentally too many severe disease type being assigned to one treatment rather than another. It facilitates the blinding of allocation, and I know the term single blind and double blind can be misleading, but they're also what is most commonly used in describing a trial design. And generally speaking, single blind means that the patients don't know what they're doing or what's happening, and double blind means no one knows what's going on. Um, and because of this, it creates a greater power because you've control for the confounding and potential bias from selection. Um, no one knows what's been going on, so you don't have um, response bias, and therefore differences between treatments can be attributed to the treatment impact, not chance. Decking spoke about different types of trial design yesterday that could be randomised. Cluster trials, crossover trials, um, standard parallel group trials. I'm not going to talk about the differences between them because the method of randomization is the same in all of them. I will talk about subjects, which is kind of the standard terminology for a parallel group trial. But if instead of randomizing subjects, you randomize subjects to instead of a treatment to a sequence, you get a crossover trial. If instead of randomizing a subject to a treatment, you randomize a cluster to a treatment, you get a cluster trial. So the same methodology works, it's just tweaked slightly if you change your design beyond that. The randomization schedule is a list that tells you who gets what treatment. It should be reproducible in that somebody else could, should be able to get the same numbers and know that you didn't just guess them or make them up. <laughs> Give me a number, another number, great. That's not a random list. Um, and it should be secure. It shouldn't be possible for people to know what's on that list while the blind is being maintained. Generally, a random randomization schedule is built on a random number generator, so there's a random seed to start it off. Now, your computer program can choose this, you can input a value yourself, but whatever it is, you need to document what that seed was, because if you use a different seed with the same code, you'll get a different randomization schedule. So part of it being reproducible is knowing how you created it in the first place. But any of the details of the randomization that could potentially facilitate predictability should not be mentioned in the protocol. For example, blocks, if you mention the random seed, well that would make it very easy to reverse engineer the list. But also maybe the block size in certain circumstances 
could make it possible to um, de deduce certain things around it. We're going to talk about blocked randomization in a moment. Um, therefore, we create a separate randomization plan with all of the details to make a fully reproducible list in a separate document that isn't part of the protocol. That way, everybody at site, everyone involved in the trial can read the protocol, but only a restricted number of people get to see the full details of the randomization. And this is created by a statistician not involved in the trial. So therefore, they're not going to be involved in the analysis or the, implement or the interpretation of the results while knowing what the allocations might be. The most simple version of a randomization is the simple randomization list, which is just a list of randomization numbers. Um, and for every number, you have a treatment code, A or B. I'm sticking to a simple case where we've only got two uh, treatment arms. Obviously, you can expand it to more. And the allocation is balanced across the full list. This is very simple, and in most cases, it's actually too simple and inappropriate. But in order to build on the reasons for more complicated versions, you need to understand what the pitfalls are of the more, more simplistic ones. While overall subjects, say there's 100 subjects in the trial, you'll have 50 A's and 50 B's. That doesn't follow that in the first 10 subjects, you'll have 5 A's and 5 B's. Because if you've balanced over the whole list, you could actually end up with this as a perfectly valid randomization schedule. Now, in the first 11 subjects, we've got one A. What if the trial stops early? What are we going to do with this? But it's also an issue if there could be a difference in enrollment. If people who enroll early in a trial are likely to be more extreme cases who are anxious to get into a new clinical trial, and later on you have less severe cases who are a little more hesitant or kind of cast the net wider. They're not the first choice people uh, that investigators might think of you could have a serious difference between your treatment groups if you have this um, imbalance in your allocation. And because if you have an ongoing interim analysis or safety review that is looking at it, having that imbalance can really skew the results and the availability of information throughout the trial. So one of the ways of getting around this is block randomization. And I mentioned blocks earlier. It's about ensuring a balance is maintained in subsets. The treatment allocation then is balanced within a block and there are lots of blocks over the whole list so you never go more than the block size without having a balance. The choice, I'm actually going to go forward now to show you what this looks like because I think it's easier with an example and then go back and talk a bit more about it. So you can see here block one is the first four subjects, two A's, two B's. Then two A's, two B's in the second block as well, even though they're in a different order. Two A's, two B's in a different order in the third block. And then you see the start of the fourth block there. So you can never go more than, you know, if, if your study stopped early now with 13 patients in, okay, you have one extra A in the start of the fourth group, but you're going to be uh, six and seven, not 11 and one. However, the choice of block size is really important when designing a block randomization um, because it could potentially unblind your study. Um, it should, ideally, to have balance within your block be a multiple of the number of treatment arms you have. So I did a block size of four because I had two treatment arms and two of each in the block. If it was too short and say a block size of two, well, I'd know every second subject, or every group of two subjects, one was treatment A and one was treatment B. I might know which subject was each, but I would know that they were different. So then if one of those ever had to be unblinded during the course of the study, I'd know what the other one had. And this, you know, causes a risk to the blinding of your trial. That's where having a larger block is necessary. But if you have too big a block, um, you know, like 10 or 12 in a block size, you could find that you have incomplete blocks where you can't get enough patients in to finish out a block and we go back to that problem of the simple randomization with too many of one treatment type early in the block. Um, then the total number of blocks need to be the total number of randomization numbers divided by the block size. So if you have 100 patients and your block size is 4, you're going to have 25 blocks. If your block size is 6, then you need to have 102 
randomization numbers, and then you have 17 blocks of six. Um, it's, it's actually fine if you have more randomization numbers than you need. They're just numbers on a piece of paper. It doesn't cost you anything. It costs you a lot if you get to 98 subjects and you realize you need three more <laughs> and you have to increase your list and do it all again. So make it bigger than you need it and that will probably serve you well in the future. Stratified randomization then is another type, it's a kind of the next step beyond blocked randomization, where levels of known factors are included in the randomization design. The reason for this is if we think there is going to be a distinct difference between different covariates, maybe ages of patients below and above 65 years of age, or gender, or disease stage, or many other factors, and we want to make sure that they have an equal representation of the treatment groups for each of those factors, um, and that they're represented appropriately in the sample. Um, stratifying, which means basically assign a block to a factor. So you can see here the stratum male and female, um, male gets blocks one and two, female gets blocks three and four. Um, Obviously, there'd be an awful lot more blocks assigned to each of your strata, but <laughs> this is more space in the slide so you could actually see the example. <coughs> if there is an imbalance in the population prevalence, this can be useful because if females are underrepresented in a particular drug type or underdiagnosed, and you want to make sure that your females don't get sort of buried by the male effect, this helps. I mean, similarly with age diagnostics, it can be very challenging to get the right age groups uh, represented. Um, if there are different effect sizes anticipated in different strata, so there was ooh, like 15 years ago a very uh, controversial case where a hypertension medication was found to work for black people in America, but not white people. It's like kind of, you can't have racism in medicine, <laughs> but actually works better in a subgroup than for the whole population. And the fact that it doesn't work as well in one group shouldn't prevent the availability of medicine to another group. So if you anticipate that there might be a different response rate in different groups, you might want to stratify that so you can make sure you have enough of each group represented and that they are appropriately balanced uh, between treatment arms within those groups um, that you can measure it appropriately. Stratifying by more than two factors is rarely necessary um, and you know, fact, uh, strata with multiple factorial levels, so here I'm using binary, but if you start using things that have five factors and you have two strata with five factors each, and like, now you've got 25 groups. <laughs> That's gonna get very difficult to fill and likely to lead to incomplete blocks and imbalance between treatments. Um, keep it small, keep it focused. It's probably as much as you need. If, however, you have a case where you do absolutely need multiple covariates to be considered, you probably need to be thinking about dynamic randomization, in particular, covariate adaptive randomization. Um, dynamic randomization is a process by which the randomization algorithm that assigns people between treatments changes based on the people who turn up in your trial. The first type, covariate adaptive, is based on the characteristics of the people at baseline, so male, female, their age, their disease history, and any other factor that you care to include. Um, one of the most prevalent um, techniques for this is called minimization. And basically the algorithm goes, right, well if I take this patient, and given all the patients I've already got in the trial on drug A and drug B, if I put this patient in drug A, what is the imbalance between drug A and drug B on age, race, sex, etc. else. Now, what if I do the same and put them in drug B? How much of an imbalance am I creating? Then which option minimizes my imbalance? Right, that's the drug they get. It allows you to basically stratify across a huge number of continuations in a sort of a continuous version rather than in a binary way. Um, but the algorithms are complicated can be a bit of black box thinking and your outcome is only as good as your inputs. So, you know, it only also balances for what you've planned for. If there is an unknown covariate that you haven't controlled for, it could actually introduce confounding uh, for that. Response adaptive randomization is what um, 
Professor Alistair Nichols was saying about earlier during the platform trial, where the outcome um, and which dr a drug was working better affected what drug the new patient was assigned to. Um, so your probability of getting a drug, you are increasingly likely to get the better performing drug as the trial goes on. Practically, there's a, a huge problem with this. Unless you're running a platform trial that's lasting seven to ten years, um, what is your measurement interval of your outcome and how fast is your recruitment? Because if you've got patients coming in every day and it takes you um, three months to get a measurement, you don't have any results to affect your enrolment and your allocation. And Alistair spoke to that where the COVID trials were using a 21-day outcome rather than a 90-day outcome. They needed the information fast in order for the adaptive algorithm to be useful. Um, this is good in rare diseases where, one, there's not very many patients, and two, it takes them a while to turn up into your trial. So you want to make sure everyone is getting the best possible care. But in many other say, settings, it may just not be practical to do. So it's something to consider on the practicality of the randomization method too. Balancing is a term used to describe confounding between the site or the location at which your trial is conducted and the treatment. If you have a single site trial, this is not an issue. If you have a multi-center trial, this could be. ICHE9, which is Statistical Principles for Clinical Trials, recommends stratifying by center. So you make each block goes to a different center, each center gets a different block, so that you have that balance. But if you have a huge number of sites and only very few subjects expected each site, and I've worked on some trials where we could have 200 sites and one to two patients expected at each site. If I give each of those sites a block of size six, none of my blocks are gonna be complete. I have no way of being sure that I'll actually have a balance between A and B at the end of the trial if all of these people are incomplete blocks. Also, because you're uh, sending kits for the full block that could be randomized, a lot of them are going to go unused at the end of the trial. There are now different technologies available that mean we don't have to divide our list up and give this list to that site and this list to that site and this list over here. We can have one central list and the site rings in to the central location and says, what should I give my next treatment, my next patient? And they get the next number on the global list. So one site might get B, 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 but that's because three other sites called in in between their patients and got the A's. Um, this is generally managed by, it used to be an interactive voice response system, which is where you rang up on the telephone. Now it's more likely to be an interactive web response system where it's part of the interface of your data capture and registration for the trial. Um, and then because that central system monitors how many subjects on each drug are at that site, right, well, I'll send the right number of kits of the treatment type that site is using to that site so that it reduces some of the waste. However, <laughs> depending on where your sites are located, that sort of just-in-time resupply may not actually be valid. It may be too time-consuming. You may end up with having subjects unable to get treatment because there isn't a drug on the shelf for them because you've run out because you took too, too many too quickly. And that's something to be considered as well. If those drug kits, though, are labelled with the randomization number of the subject, if the subject discontinues, that drug is gone. You can't use it. It's got a number that isn't for anybody else. And uh, then the balancing must be done with site stratification because otherwise you wouldn't have the right randomization numbers at site, the right kits. But if you separate your lists, so you have a separate randomization list and a separate list for labeling your medicines, your kits, your vials, your blister packs, whatever your drug is being distributed in, then you have a behind the scenes way of linking. This subject has got a randomization number that randomizes them to treatment B. Over here, this kit number is treatment A. This kit number is treatment B. Give them kit number this. No one knows, except the system, which way they're uh, connected. But that connection happens behind the scenes to make sure that if that patient doesn't come in and someone else comes in tomorrow who's also on treatment B, they can get the kit that they didn't use. And it means that the drug is always redistributable. 
um, and reduces the waste. Um, I kind of touched on this before, but I'll say it again. More numbers than you need. It is much easier to have a list of 10,000 numbers for 100 bottles in a trial because what happens if a shipment goes lost, gets damaged, is contaminated, and you have to label up a new batch and you don't have the numbers for it. If you've got extra numbers, it's easy just to stick them on. You'll know the right uh, treatment allocation will be maintained. Um, but just on the logistics side, you have to have a way of con connecting the randomization number that went to the subject, the treatment number that was assigned to the subject, so that you can verify at the end that what the treatment they were meant to get and the treatment they actually got did actually line up. Because it's very easy for someone to take, and it did actually happen in a trial, drug number 104912 and drug 109412 were on the shelf beside each other in the, in the pharmacy. And the wrong one was given to the subject. They actually got treatment A and they should have been on treatment B. I mean, it happens. So you need to have a way of checking to know about it. As a statistician, I feel obliged to talk about the analysis after you've done your randomization. The analysis must follow the design. So if you have stratification factors, they must be included in the analysis model. So you can now have a lot of extra things in your model. Additional non-stratification factors can also be included in your analysis though. So is that factor really needed as a stratification factor? Could you get the same answer to your question by using a subgroup analysis instead and simplifying your randomization? Statisticians should be consulted for the study design, including the randomization and the analysis to make sure that you are operating with full knowledge and making the right choices for the outcomes you want to measure. In summary, keep it simple, as simple as you can while still meeting your trial objectives. Be aware of the practical constraints as well as the scientific objectives. What might look great in theory may not actually be achievable at site. So engage your clinical counterpoints, your statistical counterpoints as well um, to get that full perspective of what's possible. Are you going to balance centrally or by site? Be aware of the different um, implications of what those decisions mean. Um, because obviously balancing centrally requires additional financial considerations to have a system that can do that for you. The analysis must follow the design and consult a statistician, which is always the advice I finish with. Thank you.